mother and two adult children, sons aged 23 and 21 years old. Their bodies were found on Tuesday in the home. Police say the shooting happened on Monday at around 7 in the evening. And today, the RCMP announced the case is being investigated as a triple murder-suicide. Homicide investigators are confirming that this does not appear to be an incident of partner violence. At this stage, preliminary findings suggest that one of the family members was the shooter. Lee says final confirmation will depend on an autopsy and ballistic report. He says investigators haven't yet identified which family member was the shooter, but he confirmed it was not the father. He confirmed that the son, who's age 23, has a legal uh, firearms license and access to firearms, and we were able to recover a weapon at the scene. Police are not identifying the names of the deceased at the request of their extended family. The case has shocked the quiet Richmond neighborhood where the family lived and the shooting took place. It's traumatic for all the neighbors involved and the investigators. Uh, it was a uh, very um, complex scene to deal with. He says part of the investigation will be defined if there were any issues within the family or any warning signs leading up to the shooting. Brady Strachan, CBC News. BC is marking an anniversary today. Auspicious? Not particularly. On this day, two years ago, the province identified its first case of COVID-19. Since then, there have been multiple waves and variants, and as Bell Puri tells us, likely many more to come. So this person is a male in his 40s and a resident of the Vancouver Coastal Health Region. And so it began. BC's first case of COVID-19, a man who regularly traveled to China for work. On his most recent trip, he'd been to Wuhan City where the virus had already raged for a year. We are here today in a very different place than two years ago. The milestones are, for the most part, bleak. Since January 2020, hundreds of thousands of British Columbians have been sick with COVID. Remembering where we have been and what we have come through can help us put where we are today in a perspective. Over 2,500 people have died from the virus. And with the Omicron wave just peaking, this week saw some of the highest daily death counts in two years. 40% of those deaths were in long-term care facilities. Most of the people who are dying outside of those outbreaks are older people with underlying illnesses. Um, a high proportion of them are people who don't have the protection from vaccination. Two of the people who died from COVID this week were in their 40s and unvaccinated. Over the two years, variations of restrictions on activities and gatherings have remained. A review is planned for mid-February with the hope some may be lifted in time for Family Day. As for successes, officials say since the first vaccines became available in B.C., immunization has been the province's greatest tool against the virus, but it's been an arduous journey. And it's certainly been a long two years. This is, as I understand it, the 276th uh, briefing today. January 2020 was also when most B.C. residents first much. met provincial yes. health officer Dr. Dr. Bonnie That's Henry, often noted for her pension for jewelry and shoes, yesterday. wearing the same jacket now, as she did then, Henry says was a small homage to the anniversary, the anniversary of an event, she says, that isn't done with us yet. Bell Peary, CBC News, Vancouver. The number of people hospitalized with COVID-19 continues to inch towards 1,000. 990 are now in hospital with the coronavirus, 141 of those in intensive care. Nine more people have died of COVID-19 in the past 24 hours, bringing the total to nearly 2,600. Ongoing health care outbreaks now sit at 58. That's a drop of four from yesterday. And a proposed gondola up Burnaby Mountain is a bit closer to reality tonight. City Council has officially endorsed one of the routes. But as Zara Premji is finding out, while many students seem to be thrilled, some community members living in the area, not so much. I've loved this neighbourhood for a long time and I don't want to see it destroyed. For Brenda Gunderson, Forest Grove has been home for 34 years and she doesn't want to see her home invaded by a gondola overhead. I think more people just coming over us and the noise. I, I just think it's too intrusive. The city of Burnaby has announced its endorsement for the proposed project and that's not welcome news for her neighbours. Please don't put it up here. <laughs> yeah, it's going to have an effect. And the city says it empathizes with community members who are concerned. 
there's no doubting that there, there's going to be some effects to that community. But, you know, there's going to have to be tough decisions made to meet, to meet these climate change goals. The Godola project has been in consultation for more than 10 years, and Burnaby's mayor says it's about time the project is approved. Studies estimate the gondola would arrive every minute and cut the roughly 15-minute bus ride up and down the hill for the students by more than half. As well as cut down bus lineups and wait times. I'll surely support them because it's great. It's my second year. It's still two to three years more. So yeah, it would be great for future students as well. Anything would beat going up the snow in the middle of the winter with the buses. But at the same time, like, where's that money coming from? TransLink's projections show it could cost around $200 million. Well, that'll be part of the discussions with the Mayor's Council. And that if it goes through there, then the biggest challenge of all will be to get funding. Mayor Hurley says City Council endorses the most direct route up and down Burnaby Mountain from Production Way University Skytrain Station to University City and SFU. And that means it would go over top of neighborhoods like Gunderson's. A layout of the Mayor's Council's 10-year plan isn't expected to be revealed until July, but the chair, Mayor Jonathan Cote, says it's a project he supports and would like to see near the top of the 10-year goals. And Gunderson says she'll hold on hope that the gondola won't come into her community anytime soon. Zara Premji, CBC News, Burnaby. It's got to say, on a day like today, a gondola ride at Burnaby Mountain, not so bad. I was thinking that myself. Yeah, lovely sunset, sunshine. Anita, the real test in opinion, I think, will come Wednesday when we may have snow mm. on uh, Burnaby Mountain. So, yes, we'll check in then. Uh, we do have big changes in the forecast saying goodbye to the fog and hello to the rain, but it should hold off until tomorrow night. Let me take you through the temperatures first. One more chilly night tonight. A four right now at YVR. We actually hit eight earlier today. That's the warmest we've been all week thanks to that dense fog. We really lost that inversion today. A band of fog hanging on through the strait, but generally that high pressure system sinking south and east, opening the door to the Pacific weather maker that's bringing showers to the coast and snow to Prince George right now. That's what's headed our way. So taking you through the overnight, I do think if you're up early tomorrow morning, we'll see some breaks in the clouds or at least high clouds before things thicken up around noon. At this point, it looks like the showers will roll in sort of around 3, 4 p.m. I got to tell you, the models keep pushing them earlier and earlier. So be prepared for uh, late afternoon showers ramping up uh, overnight and lingering through Sunday. At this point, it's an all shower story, though, for Metro Vancouver, getting some good uh, mountain snow and mountain pass snow. But after this rain event, uh, big changes next week, including that snow event I was talking about, Anita. So uh, I'll time it out and talk about her chances coming up a little later. Okay, I've been thinking about that one. So looking forward to hey, hearing good. what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds Th good. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. The weather update is brought to you by Sophia Financial Group of Raymond James Limited. Register now for our free cash flow connection series at sophiaevents.ca. Well, they've been on the move for days, picking up trucks, cars, RVs, and momentum as they drew closer to Ottawa. Tonight, the truck convoy of protesters are arriving on Parliament Hill. As Travis Dunraj explains, security is tight and the situation is tense. Sounds of horns blared all over downtown Ottawa on a frigid night. The cold not keeping protesters from delivering their message. I'm a vaxxed trucker and I'm here to support my unvaxxed colleagues. It's wrong to force people to undergo a med medical procedure against their will. What I have been seeing so far is every single Canadian doing what they do and is peacefully protesting and loving each other and spreading cheer and hope and happiness. Yeah! Just take a look around. We are in front of the Parliament buildings right now and there are already hundreds of protesters, dozens of trucks lining Wellington Street and this is just the night before. The main convoys, well, they haven't even arrived yet. Indeed, thousands more are expected by early afternoon. Convoys from the east, west and south on the road today, all set to converge in Ottawa. The leader of the official opposition tweeted he met with truckers today and says Trudeau should do the same. The prime minister is isolating because of a COVID exposure. You're prepared to stay for a month? Yeah. I got a month's worth of food in there. 
At this truck stop about an hour down the road, truckers arrive saying they are prepared to stay in Ottawa for weeks, even longer. They want to see an end to the vaccine mandate for cross-border truckers and say it puts the supply chain at risk. If we're not bringing the food, if we're not bringing the products, you guys are screwed. So you mess with the truckers, you have to deal with it. The convoy has picked up people with a variety of grievances along the way. As for concerns about security, the protesters we talk to say that's media and government hype. We're all doing this peacefully. We all have to sign a contract and a uh, code of conduct. We're all on board with this. This is for all of Canada, not just for Ontario or not just for the truckers. This is for everyone. For more on the convoy and the discussion it's been creating around the country, we have Shachi Curl, president of Angus Reid Institute. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Anita. Can you tell us more about who these truckers are? Well, I think based on the news reports that we've been hearing, journalists we've been hearing from, what we're dealing with are, are really two, two aspects of the people who are joining this protest, supporting this protest, making up this convoy. Uh, we understand from, from reporters, in, including those on the CBC, that some of these folks have um, organizational roots in different uh, extremist organizations, or they're espousing more than just issues or complaints with uh, vaccine mandates. On the other hand, you have a lot of folks who are donating to, supporting, turning out for, waving at the convoy as it as it heads into Ottawa uh, and as it settles into Ottawa for the night now, who are people who are really just feeling like they are done with, uh, with this requirement for uh, truckers to be vaccinated in, in order to cross the border. And that's the issue that, that they are disputing and wanting to have a conversation about and move the government on. So, you know, there's, there's two parts of this. I think some, some of the statements, some of the attitudes and signage we've been seeing uh, really comes from the more extremist or frankly boneheaded aspect of this convoy. But I think in there too are some people who, who want to talk about vaccine mandates. Yeah, and let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, what do we know about public opinion in general when it does come to vaccine mandates? Well, so first of all, just the data around vaccination rates and our own population tells us the proof is in the jabbing. More than 80% of Canadians are now uh, at least double vaccinated. One third are, are triple vaccinated or boosted. Uh, and when you look at the numbers of people who are unvaccinated, it's still fairly significant. So almost as many as 20% have either not had a shot at all uh, or, or uh, are, are only dealing with one shot. So what that tells us is that when even when you take kids out of the equation, there are about there are millions of uh, Canadian adults who won't get vaccinated at this stage. And so when it comes to public opinion, Broadly, you see majority views of uh, pro-vaccines, vaccine passports, uh, but at the same time, it doesn't include everyone, and you are still dealing with pockets of resistance or opposition that, that are fairly significant, that include millions of adult Canadians. Now, when it comes to mandates specifically, Anita, it really depends on the job. So if uh, when Canadians were asked, you know, how do you feel about requiring people in certain roles or certain professions to be vaccinated, high, high levels of support for those who are teachers, those working in restaurants, restaurants, medical professionals, first responders, a little bit different and less inclination to uh, force people, for example, in the construction, trades, uh, owner operators who are just running their own business or not really interacting with people. You see uh, support for a mandated vaccine requirement for those folks to drop to only about 50%, just over 50% support. So it really depends on who's what job or what profession we're talking about and and as we see depending on the profession there there really does leave a lot of uh, room for for a couple of sides on, on this issue no kidding for sure and we've seen that uh plenty of division these days for sure but since we do have such high vaccine uptake in this country a lot of people might view this convoy as a fringe group of canadians what do you make of that 
Well, again, um, I think that in terms of the more extremist views that are being espoused that go much further than just talking about uh, mandatory vaccination for uh, a small percentage of truckers who have not been vaccinated in this country, yes, there are some fringe elements, there are some extremist elements, but again, the number of Canadian adults overall who are vaccine hesitant or vaccine uh, resistant still adds up to a big number. So there is still some work to do around countering either hesitancy or resistance or misinformation that's leading people to say, I don't want to get vaccinated. So, you know, Canada still leads a lot of comparable countries on vaccination rates, but it's really important for, for everyone to remember most doesn't mean all. And when you're dealing with a population of 38 million people, uh, even a minority of that group still represents a, a big chunk of the Canadian population. Shachi Curl, thank you. Thanks for having me. A live look tonight at the awesome. truck crossing Pacific Highway border tonight in Surrey. No lineups. And those who could go over, well, not anymore. The flood exemption to get groceries and gas is over. Pre-entry arrival and testing and quarantine requirements were waived for some local residents after the Fraser Valley floods. But with improving conditions, the federal government says those waivers are no longer needed and that the international travel at this time is still not recommended. Okay, so as those truckers move into Ottawa, the capital is bracing for a weekend of gridlock and protest, but not every trucker is on board with it. We hear from them next. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. A Scandinavian winter activity is gaining popularity in New Brunswick. Bobesen Est purchased 14 kick sleds for residents to borrow for free. The community near Moncton is believed to be the first in the province to offer them. The CBC's Alexander Silberman had a test run. Where did the idea come from for the municipality to buy snow sleds? The idea came from our, our mayor, uh, Louise Landry, who this past summer purchased uh, some kick sleds and told me about it. So made a little research on, on the web and discovered they were shipped in to Quebec City from Norway. And I looked and tried for a grant in the province of New Brunswick. And fortunately, uh, thank you, GNB, we got a grant and we purchased 14 uh, kick sleds. rented them over the weekend for the first time after seeing that on social media um, and it was something that looked fun so we decided to call uh, Bobassin S to rent them and we had a blast over the weekend so we decided to rent some for the kids uh, for this week since uh, it's all, all it's only online learning so they have more time to uh, play in the, the snow and outside. <laughs> You call in, you come in at the office, we take some information, and you can uh, rent it free for, for three days for, for the citizens of, of Bobosa S and, uh, and Capoe. And let me assure you that at the end of three days, when you bring them back, I have another list of people or families waiting to pick them up because uh, it's new and it's kind of cool. As long as they become available, like we want to give others their turn too, so. We, uh, we rent them for a few days, return them back, a few days after call back if they have them again. And we plan on doing that for the rest of the winter if, uh, if it, the snow keeps uh, on the ground. <laughs>
some Quebecers turned out to show their support for the trucking convoy too. A number of truckers gathered today at border crossings before hitting the road to the main event. Sarah Levitt visited a truck stop at one of those crossings and dialed into the debate. At one of Canada's busiest land border crossings, the convoy is a hot topic. I think it's awesome. This American truck driver says he first heard about the protests on his way through Georgia. He's vaccinated, but he's opposed to mandates. We only got 40 drivers now that can cross. So it's 40 guys that are going back and forth, back and forth, and staying up here just to keep commerce going. While Canada requires all truckers entering the country to be vaccinated, the U.S. has a similar rule for non-Americans. The Canadian Trucking Alliance says the majority of those making the trips are already vaccinated, up to 90 percent. If you're vaccinated, you protect you and you protect all the, the older people. The requirements are essential, says this Canadian truck driver. CBC News agreed to keep his name confidential because he fears repercussions for speaking out against the protest heading to Ottawa. For me, it's, it's a joke. It's a minority, but this minority uh, doesn't respect the rule. He's not the only one surprised by the aggressive intolerance for any disagreement. This truck driver with a popular industry blog recently came out against the protest. I get every hour maybe two or three really bad uh, emails or messages and I don't really want to talk about it because I'm worried it's going to influence people to find me online and, and send me more. Though vaccinated, Frédéric Bisson is just out of isolation after contracting COVID from a colleague. He doesn't like how this protest has evolved. While we didn't sign up for that kind of protest, we didn't think it was going to be like that. And now we feel, and I feel, it's a little bit out of control. So he'll stay away and continue to take this crossing alongside many others. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Saint Bernard de la Colle, Quebec. A number of grocery store employees say that extra compensation for their efforts that was available in the early part of the pandemic isn't around anymore. They say among the retail workers who got the so-called hero pay, as Allison Northcott explains, these essential workers say the latest Omicron wave shows they're still facing dangers, and that needs to be recognized. Pandemic pay, Adam Lee says working as a grocery cashier during the Omicron wave is an added pressure and risk workers should be compensated for. I'm not asking to be treated like a superhero, far from that. Uh, what I am asking for you know, on behalf of myself, on behalf of other workers, is pay that's in line with the added risk that we're taking on at work. During the first wave, several chains, including grocery stores, drug stores, and home improvement stores, gave pandemic pay bonuses, in most cases an extra $2 an hour on employee paychecks. While some companies, including Costco and Home Depot, have since made pay increases permanent, others have pulled the bonuses back. The risk got greater, not less. Karen Lobb has worked at a grocery store for 27 years. The pandemic pay was extremely uplifting for us and financially and morale wise it really was it really helped us we felt like they actually cared about us and then when they took it away the pandemic didn't go away some chains are thanking employees with discounts or gift cards but there's a push for big retailers to reinstate higher pay the work that people are doing on the front lines like in grocery stores is valuable and important work it's allowed these companies to continue to make exceptional profit during a pandemic and it's why they're calling to be recognized for that the united food and commercial workers union says it was successful in negotiating permanent pay hikes with some bc chains including save on foods and says the pandemic added momentum to that fight wages that have been stagnating. This associate professor of economics says a pay bump could help companies with the current labor crunch, but the sector needs permanent solutions. You can think about not just wages, but benefits in general or working conditions in general. Because he says many of those issues predate the pandemic and will likely outlast it too. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. The country's top doctor says the seven-day average case counts and surveillance trends indicate the Omicron wave of COVID-19 has peaked nationwide. But Theresa Tam cautions hospitalizations remain at a record high.
Over the same period, an average of close to 10,800 people with COVID-19 are being treated in our hospitals each day, including over 1,200 in intensive care units and 168 deaths were reported daily. This is why it continues to be important to limit spread as much as possible. And while Omicron cases are dropping, Canada has identified more than 100 cases of the new subvariant, referred to as BA2. Tam says it's too early to know its impact on the trend, but they haven't seen a specific increase in severe outcomes from this subvariant. Meanwhile, early research shows that boosters offer much more protection against Omicron and dramatically lower the risk of severe illness. Making a statement on the hill, how one Olympic skier is honoring Canada's Indigenous heritage with her helmet. Next. Well, bad vibes today for a legendary community of hippies in British Columbia. They've been ordered to leave their makeshift homes along Sombrio Beach on Vancouver Island. As Terry Molesky reports, squatters are getting the boot to make way for more tourists. To her, it's paradise. No job, no mortgage, no electricity, no phone, no bills. Her name is Sachi. That means blissful mother in Sanskrit. Her home is a shack made of driftwood and plastic, but what a location. Sombrio Beach, stormy and unspoiled, it's known as the last hippie colony on Vancouver Island's wild west coast. For 20 years, people have run from the rat race to live here rent-free. We have the right to life, you know, we have the right to exist, and in existence, we need space to exist. But she's losing her space. Sachi Trillium was born on this beach. Her parents were squatters here too, but now the British Columbia government plans to kick her out and burn down her shack, along with about 15 others on this beach. It's going to be part of a West Coast hiking trail to bring in tourists. What the government wants, the government gets. The Park Act does not allow for permanent residences within the, within the park, so that's really what, what's happening here. It's a change in land use. It's now a provincial park. Uh, which does not uh, permit uh, permanent residence. No one's going to be dragged away by force. They still have a couple of weeks to pack up and move on. But Neil Bredo, who's lived here for six years, says the world needs somewhere that people like him can run away to. This is where I turned from a boy into a man because when I was younger, I had no idea what to do with my life. I was traveling around till I came to this place and no, I'm just living. Brito believes the government's afraid that tourists will be upset by untidy squatters shacks when he says it's just the opposite. A lot of people enjoy seeing this lifestyle. That, it's like going to a foreign land for them. You know, it's that exciting. It's like, wow, there's something really different happening here. The people of Sombrio Beach say, don't worry, we won't put up a fight, we'll go quietly. But they insist they'll just find another beach and the dream of life in paradise will not die. I plan to move to another beautiful paradise somewhere out there off the concrete. Come on up. But finding somewhere off the concrete is getting more difficult. The 90s have arrived here and paradise is being downsized. Jory Malewski, CBC News on Sombrio Beach. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Homicide investigators are making an urgent plea in connection with the death of a realtor in Coquitlam. They're looking for dash cam footage and to talk to anyone who was in the area yesterday afternoon. 32-year-old Romina Shaw was stabbed in a parkade and later died in hospital. The mom of three from Maple Ridge worked in the area. 
please don't put it up here. <laughs> yeah, it's going to have an effect. You know, by the time they build the, the lines and the posts and everything it takes to, to going up there, it'll, it'll affect our green belt. A step closer to a gondola up SFU has some residents angry, but the city of Burnaby gives its blessing to the big transit project, and students are welcoming the decision, saying it's a big step forward for the Hilltop University campus. With just a week to go before the start of the Olympics, five members of Team Canada are under COVID-19 protocol after arriving in Beijing. It's unclear whether they tested positive or are just in quarantine. Renee Filipponi looks at what the host nation is doing about it. Chinese officials are taking no chances. With strict COVID protocols in place, anyone involved in the Beijing Olympics will spend the games behind fences. International media, some who've been here for weeks, say their movements are limited. Japan was not that strict like this, like in Beijing. The people felt a little bit more relaxed to stay in Tokyo, but here it's like really strict. So I think there's a lot of stress. Despite having three COVID tests before flying to Beijing, those members of Canada's Olympic team that have been placed in COVID-19 protocol would have either tested positive on arrival or been a close contact of someone positive. The Canadian Olympic Committee says there will likely be persistent shedders among the delegation, meaning people who test positive long after they had COVID. They will need multiple negative tests to get out of isolation. The risk is not zero, but with basic precautions, the risk should be tolerable and I think that we saw with um, the Tokyo Olympics. 12 years ago, David Cobb was getting ready for the Vancouver Olympics. He says the lead up to any games is stressful, never mind COVID. You know, they have to make sure that uh, they do everything they can to keep the virus out of their bubble. Um, certainly for the athletes, but all the other officials and people that participate in one way or another. So that's, I'm sure, their toughest challenge right now. Outside the Olympic bubble, residents in Beijing are concerned. This woman says she hopes that everyone stays safe and healthy. Very few tickets to events will be available to locals. A disappointment for this sports fan who wanted to be in the stands. Instead, she, like so many others, will be watching these games from home. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. BC's Cassidy Gray will soon be competing in the Olympics. And at the same time, the 21-year-old skier will be honoring local First Nations with a helmet designed by a shoe swap artist. It's nice to kind of have this as a, it kind of keeps me connected to home and home connected to me. Like the people that I grew up with, they feel probably a bit more connected to me because I have something that relates directly to them that's always with me. Gray and 17-year-old artist Trinda Cote collaborated on the design with the goal of bringing the struggles of First Nations peoples to the world stage. She's wearing it here at the World Cup in France in December. Gray grew up learning about the plight of First Nations at school in Invermere, and she wanted to shine a light on the experience. And while she can't wear the helmet for Olympic competition, she says she will be wearing it during all of her practice sessions. We are joined now by the artist herself, Trinda Cote. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. First off, can you tell us what it means to have Cassidy Gray wearing your design and sharing your Indigenous history on the world stage? Oh, I mean, I am so honoured. Um, it is, it's never something that I could have dreamed of doing. Um, I mean, just being able to even do the piece for her and just having it have her, having her bring it with her is just such an incredible feeling. And the piece features a salmon. That's the main focus of the design. Can you talk about your choice around that and also the colors involved? Oh, my people were, were originally called the salmon people. So I really wanted to focus the whole design on salmon just to honor that. And uh, in our valley, we're surrounded by mountains. So one of the main designs I also wanted to include was one of our biggest mountains in the valley, which is the Nelson Mountain, Mount Nelson. And so I added that in the dorsal fin. And I mean, during these hard times, I think that it was super important for me to add Every Child Matters 
And having a close family member actually endure the trauma of residential schools, I think it was really important for me to add in the orange for that as well. Absolutely. And have you had any feedback on, on the design? And, you know, especially because she is wearing this in places like Austria and France all over the world. Yeah, the feedback has been incredible. I mean, especially everyone, since I live in such a small town, I always have people just coming up and saying how cool it is, which is honestly such an amazing thing. Um, and I've had, you know, family members from, you know, in the States and everything, just contacting me and saying how proud they are. So it's, it's amazing feedback. Awesome. Well, really cool design. And thank you for being on the show today, Trinda. Yeah, thank you so much. Manitobans might be used to the cold and know how to dress for it, but for newcomers, well, they're in for a bit of a frosty surprise. How an international student is trying to change that next. At 637, you're looking at a live shot down Camby Street in Vancouver. A clear night, but I gotta say, I'm still distracted by this promise of the white stuff. Joe breaks it all down next. Perfect stick curve. Just call me Bobby Orr, Orlando. <laughs> oh, hello! It is I, Mr. Orlando, here with my trusty stick at the beautiful Ted Reeve Arena to ask, what in the Olympic Winter Games is this? Hey, look at me, Mr. Orlando. I found an ice hammock. What? <laughs> that is not an ice hammock. It's called a hockey net. Nets are used as a goal in many sports. Hockey players try to shoot the puck past the goalie and into the net. That counts as a goal. And of course, a goal looks a little something like... What the... Gary! This is the life, isn't it, Mr. Orlando? Gary, get off of that net so I can score a goal, please. Oh, too late, Mr. Orlando. I've already scored. A dream vacation spot. <laughs> hey, could you rub some sunscreen on my back? It always burns back there. <sighs> I'm the one that needs a vacation. Well, there's plenty of room in here, Captain. <sighs> Why don't you grab yourself a drink? And maybe a blanket. You got plenty of ice. Mm. I think that people sometimes look at me and get it all wrong. What do people usually think when they see you? Oh, I can totally relate to that. Um, people look at me and first off, they often are shocked whenever they see me in public. I've had people in malls, grocery stores come up to me and touch me and be like, I'm so happy to see you out. And I'm like, do it living? Okay, that's interesting. Um, I think people don't expect me to be an entrepreneur whenever I tell them I own a business, they say, oh, okay, but like who started it? And I tell them I did. And they're like, oh, okay, but a family business? And I'm like, no, it was and by me. myself. It was, I did this by myself and that I went to school. I think it always surprises people, but what I try to do instead of being like angry or frustrated with people is I just try to educate them and let them know that there's not one view of disability. There's not one view of someone in a wheelchair. There could be another person who's a quadriplegic just like me, but have more function or less function and disability just like every other person on this world comes in many shapes and sizes. In the year 2050, how will BC look? From agriculture to cities, how will climate change change life? 
Don't miss 2050 Degrees of Change, a CBC Vancouver original podcast, now available. A lifelong sailor from Ontario isn't letting the cold weather keep him off the water, even if it's frozen. This winter, he traded in his downhill snow gear for the flat-out thrill of something that's pretty rare around here, an ice boat. Have a look. So I, I started out way back when, uh, in my late teens, early 20s, probably windsurfing. So I, I really understood the physics of, of sailing. And all, actually, you know, this brings me back to my memories as a kid, and this is uh, an ice boat, specifically it's a DN, and uh, so they were all made of wood, and this one was handcrafted uh, for me about 25 years ago from a guy in Kingston, I ordered it from him. And uh, so it's a beautiful, it's almost like buying a violin or uh, something like that, because it's like, you know, you don't want it to get wet. You don't want it to, you want to take care of the wood and all that kind of stuff, right? So this, this ice boat will go about three times faster than the wind. So if the wind is like, let's say 20 miles per hour, I can go 60 on this. And uh, so you have to be a little careful because you can get chunks of ice. The skates on the bottom of it are about, you know, five inches tall. So you have to be able to make sure you can, you can go over the chunks of ice and stuff like that. You just, you, you, live, you live your life by the wind when, you're, when, you're, when you do this kind of a thing, yeah. So it's kind of, a, it's really kind of fun. And there's no other people to worry about. It's, the thing, like, unlike skiing and snowboarding, which I also do or haven't done for a while, I'm always worried about the young whippersnappers on the slope coming down and knocking me down, you know, and I'm goofy, so I'm backwards. So they're all the other way around. So we can't see each other sometimes. Whereas here, you know, I can see, there's nobody on the ice hardly at all. Well, let's bring in meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff now. I had no idea that this was a thing, but I love it. It's very cool. It is very cool, literally, yes. And I love the, yeah. the slogan, uh, live by the wind. Definitely for daredevils. The thing is, if you fall, I feel like the ice isn't as forgiving. So there's an extra element there along with the speed. Uh, I, I can understand why it's been a big sport this year for the Great Lakes. Take a look at the current temperatures. We've got extreme cold warnings back in place uh, from basically southern Ontario through southern Quebec. Right now, minus 16 in Toronto. That's without the wind chill. Extreme cold alerts in place for wind chills close to minus 35 tonight. And uh, we'll feel those temperatures all the way up through the Gaspé Peninsula into uh, uh, parts of Labrador. Now, there's something else going on on the East Coast, a major winter storm. Before I get to our few showers we have to get to and the possibility of a skiff of snow next week, I thought I would get you to uh, the blizzard conditions happening now from basically Virginia through to Maine that will then push up into Atlantic Canada, those red warnings you see. Those are blizzard warnings. So major cities along the eastern seaboard looking to see blizzard conditions overnight tonight and tomorrow morning. States of emergencies have been declared uh, for 40 centimeters, 100 kilometer per hour winds. And Atlantic Canada looking to get into this storm uh, through the weekend. Winter storm warnings in place. It has been storm after storm, weekend after weekend for the east coast. 40 centimeters for parts of the Maritimes. 100 kilometer per hour winds for Newfoundland uh, through the weekend. So that was just to soften you up before I get you to the uh, rain that's moving in this weekend. High pressure flattening, as I mentioned. Uh, let's track this rainmaker out. So moving down the south coast, notice inland sections, uh, Terrace, Kitimat, Stewart getting some good snow. Prince George, you're waking up to about five centimeters. And Whistler down to our North Shore Mountains looking to get uh, a good 20 centimeters this weekend. It will be a rain story beginning Saturday overnight into Sunday. And that snow will push across to the interior for Sunday. So you get by with a dry one, places like Kelowna, Kamloops, Cranbrook. Tomorrow, uh, snow will begin tomorrow afternoon for places like Kelowna. And it's really a Sunday story. So we'll switch uh, places with the coast. Port Hardy, you got, you've got that rain moving in as we speak. Prince Rupert, 80 kilometer per hour winds through tomorrow. And up towards Fort St. John, still a little milder, uh, still getting a bit of that southwesterly flow. Four degrees for tomorrow with sunshine. Uh, you'll see that snow move in uh, for Sunday as well. So changing weather for the whole province as we lose that inversion and gain Pacific air. Wanted to break down next week's forecast as well. So uh, look for the possibilities, the morning sun, evening rain tomorrow, uh, rain all through Sunday, 15 to 30 millimeters. So not a huge washout. Monday and Tuesday, good chance that these are going to be two gorgeous days for the South Coast, fairly seasonal afternoon highs. 
but things are starting to get chilly again. We've got a modified Arctic air mass moving back in towards the south coast. So that minus one overnight Tuesday into Wednesday morning, setting the scene for when we get our next pulse of Pacific moisture. So at this point, looks like most of the snow will happen Wednesday, uh, but with fresh pulses and overnight lows close to zero, we'll be seeing some lingering flurries for the end of the week. But Anita, at this point, we're talking maybe five centimeters. Okay. You know, I'll be watching that closely. Yeah, because I wasn't expecting those extra few days there, but uh, I'll take it. You know, I'll yeah, take I it. Yeah, I just stuck that in at the end. Yeah, nothing, <laughs> nothing like the East Coast, but be prepared for more weight. This sounds good. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Well, people who have lived in Manitoba for years know how to prepare for the winter. But for many newcomers arriving from warmer countries, safeguarding against extreme cold can be hard. And figuring out the best boots for their first Canadian winter is usually a big challenge. As Andrew Wilds reports, one international student decided to do something about it. What are the kind of warmth you want? What are the boot height? What are the styling? Pratik Malhotra doesn't sell boots but he's thought a lot about them. He's even made a PowerPoint to make boot buying easier for international students like himself. All those students uh, who are also like me, who have come from abroad, they could use that particular presentation. Malhotra came to Winnipeg last September from India. After going to eight stores over 25 days, he finally found his boot. When I came here from Jamaica, I didn't buy my boots until a week after it had snowed. I did tons of research online, but it still felt like I was using someone else's experience to gamble with my hard-earned money. The reason it's so hard your first winter is that you're buying something you know absolutely nothing about. And you're anxious because you can't afford to buy it twice. You have got limited resources from a financial point of view. Right from buying uh, clothes, to uh, probably utensils, I mean, like you would need to buy a bed and everything. Rashida Adeneji can relate. Adeneji is the donation and volunteer coordinator for the Canadian Muslim Women's Institute. She came from Nigeria in March with her husband and three kids. She couldn't even imagine Winnipeg below zero. She just went to a store and grabbed some boots. As soon as the snow came, she knew the gear was wrong. She got frostbite and fell twice. My children, they came back from school, they were just, you know, lamenting that this is a very wrong thing to buy for them because the snow actually uh, penetrated into their, you know, the boots. Both Malhotra and Adeneji got the help they needed from sales reps. But some newcomers, particularly refugees, aren't as lucky. That's why the Canadian Muslim Women's Institute hands out about 50 boots a month. It's a lot of them don't speak English, so it's very difficult for them to just go to the store and ask for winter boots because whatever the, st the clerk in the store is telling them, of course, it's not something that they will be able to understand. Malhotra's advice is to choose function over fashion. Andrew Wiles, CBC News, Winnipeg. Dance your cares away as Fraggle Rock reboots. The Canadian connections continue. We speak to an island puppeteer about the relaunch next. For me, the biggest was bringing joy to the children. So having them look forward to something. I mean, the visits, when we would pull up to one of the children's, their homes, and they would see us, you could see it was an entire family that would come out. So it was brothers and sisters. Sometimes it was even the neighbors who would come over to check out the ducks. It's all intimidating, but he's they were kind of shy. <laughs> he's so funny. Like, they kept running away in the tub. And when they were, I was holding them, I kind of felt like, they were nervous. It teaches them to be respectful of the animals that live on this earth, but I think that part of it is it, it shows them how to take care of them. And they really love it when they are able to see them and be a part of that entire process. Almost out. There we go. <laughs> I just cool watching them hatch. And it was cool seeing them in the incubator. What do you think that your teacher did all the extra work to be able to bring the ducks by? I thought it was kind. Yeah, 
for sure. To put in all that extra work to come and make sure that the kids were not only seeing it on the screen, but to make sure that they saw it in real time was really important. And I think it'll make a lasting impression as far as their want to learn about that continuously and to learn about nature, really. Yeah. A while back, got sick with cancer and just couldn't shake the chills. Chemo, radiation, stem cell transplant. Just for the life of me, I just was afraid of the cold. I would, I would shiver all the time and felt like it was a weakness of mine. And uh, one day, I was just at the spa doing that hot, cold sauna and, and cold water. And just, you know, this cold water feels really good. Big inhale, and a large exhale on my way in. It just became a love with the cold. We live here in winter, how many months of the year? Might as well just. Embrace it, love it, experience it. It makes me calm somehow because when you're in water, uh, you are in a survival mode. So you don't think about anything. You just want to survive. Breathing is very, very important. And you come out, you feel exhilarated. I'm sure we looked up last year, there's endorphins. It helps with, you know, pain, inflammation, fatigue, and it just feels great. We know that the cold can be very dangerous, but uh, we can use the cold to our advantage. I do it because it makes me feel alive. Join our group and you'll be instantly cool. <laughs>
Um, I, I, I went, studied acting at the University of Victoria, and then I, I auditioned for a show that was filming in Victoria in 2008, and I got trained on the job. And the robot, the reboot, looks like, you know, a massive production. So what was it like being on that set? Oh, my gosh. It, it was surreal. Like, we, we would, you'd go on set, you'd read your scripts for the day, and then you'd head in, and we had, you know, some days I'd be playing Ma Gorg, which, um, you know, she's, I'd be suiting up into this huge gear with this giant costume to his massive head that had, you know, remote control eyeballs that um, another puppeteer, Amy Garcia, was voicing and controlling the face of the puppet. I was inside of it, wearing it, moving it wow. through. And some days I'd be, you know, performing remote control little doozers. So we had three kind of gymnasium sized buildings, one with all the Gorg's house, which was the size of an actual house built indoors. And then another with all the Fraggle sets, all the caves, all the doozer caves. And the third one that was just for extras. So we had, you know, a Fraggle sized water slide and a fraggle desert cave so it was a massive massive production yeah no kidding that's incredible and i had no idea that you actually would use remote controls to to handle yeah. all the puppets that's very cool um jim henson created fraggle rock in 1983 to inspire world peace and encourage yeah. diversity how does this live up to that legacy i mean you watch the original and you watch the reboot series. It goes into really deep topics that kids, you know, want to hear about. And, and all four layers of organisms are interacting and they, they all rely on each other in ways they don't understand. They all interact and, and affect each other in ways they don't always understand. They're always kind of learning about each other and realizing that they impact beyond what's right in front of their faces. So that's, um, that's I remember what I, glommed onto as a kid is the complexity of the world and the way everything was layered together just like exploded my tiny mind <laughs> as a child. Ingrid Hansen, thank you so much for being on the show today. Ingrid is a puppeteer from Victoria who worked on Fraggle Rock, Back to the Rock. Thank you. So I'm hearing our director, Mark, was terrified of Gorgs. Mark, I'm sure you are not alone. Um, hopefully you've conquered that fear, but if not, you have another chance to do that. I have to say this looks awesome though. I'll be checking it out for sure. And lots of Canadian puppeteers working on it as well. Okay, let's get back to Earth. A new attraction near Bogota, Colombia is turning heads upside down. <laughs> I had to turn my head right now just to look at that. Uh, take a look at this house tipped the wrong way up. It's capturing the imagination of tourists who walk on ceilings where floors should be and with furniture positioned on the wrong side as well. The creator was intrigued by a similar experiment he saw when he visited his homeland of Austria six years ago, but says building it during the pandemic was difficult with setbacks and delays. Finished early in the new year, it's now providing some light fun for visitors weary of lockdowns and restrictions. Uh, that is pretty awesome, too. Hopefully one day I get to check it out once we can head out of the country again. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. We just want to remind you that if you're not already watching us on CBC Gem, you can do that. It's our free app. Have a good weekend.